Hello, my name is Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rene Castellan, who is a professor of orthopedic surgery and chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands. He has published over 150 scientific peer-reviewed papers, has been the past president of the Nordic Spinal Deformity Society of the International Research Society of Spinal Deformities, holds committee positions in the Scoliosis Research Society as well. Other uh, multiple organizations that it would take two hours to read. There are many aspects to one individual usually. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so currently, since joining the academic uh, practice in Utrecht, uh, you have focused primarily on spinal deformity, uh, both yes. clinically and scientifically, especially in the field of etiopathogenesis or the cause of idiopathic scoliosis. Mm -hmm. So the question I first have for you is, uh, you have such a passionate interest in what causes scoliosis, how it progresses and how to treat it. Where did that originate or come from? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. That's not even so, so easy to answer, but um, actually I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of, about how it started. Um, I started very much in general practice, um, trained as a general orthopedic surgeon, but always with a very big interest in, in spine and spinal deformity for, for one reason or another. I'm not sure why. I've always been fascinated by this one question, which is why does someone who has been healthy up to the age of maybe 11 or 12 or something like that, all of a sudden or relatively uh, quickly develops a deformity that has an impact on the rest of, of the person's life. And it's usually a girl and adolescence, as, as we all know. Um, you know, I've, I've had many years where I did uh, trauma care and, and hip surgery, knees, but also always actually spine. And I've always had that interest in, in spine and in scoliosis. And actually during my training years, I, I started a research project at the Department of Anatomy at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands also to, um, to look at, at scoliosis a little bit more in depth, but that um, didn't really materialize at that, at that time. Um, I ended up writing a thesis, a PhD thesis on um, uh, hip dysplasia and ultrasound evaluation of hip dysplasia. Um, but also during those years, I was a fellow at the um, Alfred DuPont Institute of the Moores Foundation, as it was called at that time in Wilmington, Delaware. And the head of that department was uh, Dr. Dean McEwen. And he has been a very big influence on my career. And, and he's been very much of a mentor for me. And as, as you may know, he's, uh, he's, he's been retired for quite some time now, but he has had a impact on scoliosis research, scoliosis care, but also hip uh, dysplasia was one of his, um, one of his um, uh, fields of expertise. And I didn't really feel like I should, should uh, try to model myself after, after his example, not at all. I mean, he, he, he was very, um, he was a very, uh, he was a very wonderful, and he still is a very wonderful man, but he was a very wonderful teacher at that time. Um, but for some reason, during my years in general practice, I, I was in general practice for about 10 years, um, doing, like I said, very general orthopedics with a lot of trauma and a lot of hip and knee surgery and things like that. Um, but also still, and at all, at all points in time, this interest in, in the spine and the deformities of the spine, but more degenerative work at that time than um, uh, more pediatric work mm -hmm. and not too much research. I mean, I was working like, like a couple, well, pretty many hours a week, uh, just trying to provide patient care. And then in 2002, yes, 2002, I got asked to become the head of the department at the University of Leiden. And I was very happy in my um, in my general practice and I was really wondering if I should do that and, and, and why I should do that go to the university and then I thought you know I've always had this this one interest that I've uh, I've always wanted to pursue and um, this might be the chance to do that so that's when I decided okay I'll go ahead and go to the University of, of uh, Utrecht I became the professor of orthopedic surgery and the chairman of the department and at Actually, then, I, as, as I've said be, before, I, I have, I've spent some time doing research at the anatomy lab in Leiden um, during my training years. But then 
after I went to Utrecht, we really started working on that topic of scoliosis. And I was very fortunate that we had a department that was very big on spine care, but not so big on scoliosis at that time. A lot of fracture, metastasis of the spine. People uh, at the department, um, like Professor Erner and Verlan and, and my good friend, uh, Professor Kraut, uh, who you know also. Yes. Um, they were all at that department at different moments in time and uh, still are. Uh, Dr. Tom Schlusser, who worked with me, uh, did his PhD with me. He became a member of that group also. So we had a great group of people and there still is a great group of people that uh, are very devoted to the spine and different aspects of the spine. And my, my area was very much the, um, the initiation and progression of scoliosis. And we, uh, we started working on that and um, had a great time. <laughs> Very good. So by definition, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, the, the initiation of cause is unknown, but you've done quite a bit of research in that area. Uh, from your perspective, uh, what maybe are the primary causes of uh, AIS? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I strongly feel that it is pri uh, primarily a mechanical problem and I'm, I'm not in sync with with many people probably because I, I know people that i admire and respect very much that are convinced that it's a brain thing brain disorder or a metabolic disorder it's a genetic disorder for sure there's genetics involved that's for sure but my um, point of view is that it is primarily a mechanical disorder of a spine that is uh, in its essence it's a rotationally unstable construct. The human spine, and I think we've shown that in many studies, the human spine is a rotationally unstable construct, unlike any other spine in nature. All other spines in nature are rotationally stable by the way they are loaded. And that, that holds true also for the bipedal uh, non-humans, uh, also the non-human primates, but also the kangaroo and what have you, all the, the different uh, species that uh, go around on, on, on two legs. Um, and there's, there have always been many bipedal species, like back to the time of the dinosaurs, there were bipedal species, but the way the human spine is loaded due to its sagittal shape with the center of gravity straight above the pelvis uh, makes it a rotationally unstable construct. So the human spine is, it's not so difficult to introduce a rotational deformity in the human spine. And then it comes down to the balance that there is during that period of rapid growth. I mean, there's many other forms of scoliosis, of course, but let's talk about adolescent idiopathic because that's the most predominant and, and that's, that's pretty much the model that we, that we study and that we think about. But if you look at ad adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, I think it's a, it's a matter of a balance or a lack of balance or a mismatch between the increasing loads during puberty, rapidly increasing mechanical loads that need to be counteracted by some, something. Those mechanical loads increase the rotatory moment on the spine. And that doesn't mean everyone starts to rotate. No, only two to 4% of the people or something in that ballpark start to rotate. But the ones that do rotate, I feel have a, um, a at, that, at that moment in time, they have a lack of rotational stability because their stabilizing system is not matured in the same phase as, as their body dimensions are maturing. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm thinking very much about the disc. I think the disc is, is the most important stabilizer of the spine. And I think if your disc is still very immature at the, at the time when you go through your growth spurt, your disc is not able to um, counteract those rotatory moments. And I think those are the two to 4% people where you have a lack of, of synchronizing between the increasing uh, dimensions of the body, not only the weight, but also the moment arm, right? you get taller. So the moment arm becomes bigger. So the increasing, increasing dimension as compared to the not yet fully matured disc. And that's not so unlogical. I mean, it may sound very, very uh, far out, but it's not so unlogical to me because the disc matures by ossifying its insertion. You know, the immature disc 
the fibers of the disc of the annulus fibrosus, the Sharpie fibers, are attached to the, um, the um, ring apophysis, which is a cartilaginous structure mm -hmm. in infancy. And then it starts to ossify during puberty, and then gradually it fuses to the vertebral body. And it seemed very logical to me that once it's fused, this insertion becomes more stable than as long as it is cartilaginous. Well, if it's still cartilaginous and your body dimensions are not too, too big, it'll hold. And if the dimensions have become too big while it's still ossifying and fusing, as compared to others where it is already fused, then I think you may have some sort of a weakness in that uh, stabilizing system of your disc vertebral body. But this is hypothesis. And we are studying that at the moment, but it is hypothesis and I cannot prove that at all. So uh, I'm not saying I know, you know, that's always the problem with, with these very complex issues. It's, they're not, it's very difficult to prove what you're saying because every time you look at a scoliotic spine, you're looking at the end product. So anything you see can be related to the cause of the problem, but it can also be related to the effect of the problem, the, the, the result of the problem, or they can just coexist, you know, simultaneously without any um, causal relation between them. So it's a difficult matter, but it's, it's very interesting. So just to, for say of clarification, for my clarification. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you can start from a mechanical weakness as you go from a quadruped to bipedal. And is it because uh, you're, your spine is going vertical compared to horizontal. And is it also because uh, when you're bipedal, you have uh, you know, two legs, so two stabilizers as opposed to four. So does that increase the instability in a vertical spine compared yeah, we, to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, well, first of all, I think bipedalism is not the issue. There's very many species that have been and still are bipedal, but the way the human spine, the, the spinal pelvic, arrangement basically is totally different in humans than in other species. And that is because we have not only a lumbar lordosis that pulls our center of gravity back, but we also have a pelvic lordosis. And we, we studied that and we published that. It was, by the way, it was uh, proposed by a guy named Kummer in the 19, I believe 1960s already. And we studied that on CTs and we actually defined that pelvic lordosis. So the angle between the ischial bone and the iliac bone is in a lordotic configuration in humans. It is more or less of a straight line in all other species, also in non-human primates it is. So that tilt in your pelvis, that is the, the angulation in your pelvis brings your, um, your, your, your uh, foundation of your spine already backward more or less. And then on top of that, you have a lumbar lordosis, which pulls it more back or continues to in that same line. So we are the only ones that have our center of gravity more or less straight above our pelvis. All other species, also the bipedal ones, have it far in front of their pelvis. And if you look at a, um, a, a non-human primate, they will always walk with bent knees and hips and, and having their hands more or less on the ground. They rarely walk totally erect. Actually, they cannot fully extend their hips and knees at the same time. And all other species cannot either, um, a kangaroo could not do that. They cannot straighten their hips and, and knees at the same time and bring their body center of gravity all the way straight above their pelvis. And because we do that, we introduce certain loads that are non-physiological, I would almost say. I mean, we've, we've been doing that for, for quite some time now during evolution, but um, we are the, the only species that, that have real dorsally directed shear loads. I mean, the spine is loaded, actually. That's the most important loading of each spine, whether it's a cow or a horse or a human being, the predominant loading is in an actual direction along the spine. Mm -hmm. So that's due to gravity, but also to muscle tension. But um, there are vectors acting on the spine and people believe in the follower load, which is a biomechanical concept. And I believe that that's, it's, it's a very, um, very valid concept, but it's mainly designed to, or, or mainly described to give stability to a, um, uh, a cadaver spine when you want to do mechanical testing on it. But there's no doubt in my mind that there, there are um, vectors 
acting on the spine. And these vectors can go in an anterior direction, which is very normal in a quadrupedal animal. You have the axial compression due to the muscle tension, but you also have the downward weight of the trunk pulling on that thing. So that's going to be an anteriorly or a ventrally directed shear load, which leads, and we did an ex vivo experiment uh, to show that many years ago, but that anterior shear load leads to a increased rotational stability. But if you turn the direction around, and that is only something that happens in human beings, if you turn the direction around, so it becomes a dorsally directed to the back, directed shear load, it reduces the rotational stability of that segment. And the segment becomes much looser and it can start rotating much more easily. So the magnitude of those dorsally directed shear loads in, 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 in this concept at least, the magnitude of those dorsally directed shear loads depends on your individual sagittal profile of your spine, which is very individually determined. Um, but it is always something that, that tries to start some rotational uh, moment. One thing for the, for the biomechanical engineers I should add is that your spine is slightly rotated as it is already. I mean, all of us without a scoliosis have a slight rotation in our spine. If the spine would not be rotated at all, that dorsal shear load would not lead to a rotation. But since it is slightly rotated to start with, we published on that also, if you add this dorsally directed shear load, the rotation tends to increase, but it depends on your stabilizing structures and it depends on your, the quality of your collagen, it depends on the quality of your disc, it depends on the maturation stage of your disc, it probably also depends on your proprioceps, whether you are very much in control over each posture in your, in your, in each position in your body, you know, all these things make it so multifactorial. And, and I think it's true, it, it, is, it is a multifactorial disease, but for me, it all begins with biomechanics of the upright human spine. Do you think the, the genetic component in um, AIS targets those components or one or two or multiple of those components and that's what is the trigger? I think your sagittal shape of your spine is genetically de determined. There are people with, with the type one uh, Rousseli and, and the other types of Rousseli that usually runs in the, in the family. You have a certain spine, it's flatter. Your, your pelvic instance is so, sort of genetically determined. Your sacral slope, which determines your sagittal curvatures to a large extent is genetically determined, but also the quality of your, your collagen is de genetically determined. Some people are loose in their joints, other are more stiff. And your maturation is genetically determined. Some people mature very early in life, others take much longer to do so. And, you know, I think that's why we have found so many genetic pathways also. Mm -hmm. I think as far as I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on genetics, but I think about 50% of the human genome has been in some way implicated in something that has to do with scoliosis. And, and there's, there's people that are great experts on this that, that can tell you much more about it. And um, I don't want to make it sure. sound more simple than it is. But um, I think all these different aspects, like your posture, your spinal pelvic alignment, your maturation phase, like everything I just mentioned, may have something to do with the genetics of scoliosis. Um, you recently published a paper indicating that um, with the phenomena uh, known as uh, RASO, RASO, relative anterior spinal overgrowth, yeah. Um, it about maybe about three times the disc to vertebra ratio in terms of the increase in the anterior column of the spine. Yeah. Um, is scoliosis possible without RASO as a phenomena, or it has to be there in order for you to go hypokyphotic then often yeah. lordotic? Yeah. Yeah, it's always there. Um, I mean, you can you can even see that on a, on a plain x-ray. If you look at a plain x-ray of the thoracic spine, for instance, with the scoliosis, what you see is that the spinous processes describe the inner arc of the total cur curvature and the vertebral body is the outer arc. Well, if you're a professional or competitive ice skater, you know that the inner uh, curve is shorter than the outer or in, in athletics. I mean, Dutch are, are into ice skating usually, but, uh, but in, in athletics and um, 
you know, car racing, anything you, you can think of. When you take the inner curve, it's shorter than the outer curve. So on the X-ray, you can also already see that the inner curve, the spinous processes, describe a shorter arc mm -hmm. than the vertebral bodies. So the anterior column is longer than the posterior column. And that is uh, that has been known for a long time. In, in eight, uh, 18, around the 1850s, von Meyer, who was an anatomist uh, in the German-speaking world, um, he, he said uh, that it is impossible to develop in eight, 1856, I think it was, but in the 1850s, long before CT scans and everything, he said it is impossible to develop a thoracic scoliosis if you have a normal kyphosis. He knew that already. Mm. And we, we, we have referred to studies from Nicola Doni and Lawrence and, and Adams and all these people, many French authors also um, have described this lengthening of the anterior column. So it has been known for a long time and it is definitely there. There's no doubt that in each idiopathic scoliosis, the anterior column is longer. Um, but what was not so well described and what was what we described in that paper is that in other types of scoliosis, you have that same configuration. If you look at a neuromuscular scoliosis, the anterior column is also longer than the posterior column. And that lengthening does not occur in the bone, it occurs in the disc. And actually in idiopathic scoliosis and in neuromuscular scoliosis, the vertebral bodies in the thoracic area are in a slight kyphosis. They're slightly wedged into kyphosis in the normals, but also in the idiopathic scoliosis and also in the neuromuscular scoliosis. But the discs are wide open anteriorly. So that anterior lengthening is, is almost 100% in the discs. Mm -hmm. And then the other study we did was to show that if you have a congenital scoliosis, so we had a number of patients where there's a very short segment, high thoracic congenital anomaly that leads to a very long gradual um, curve underneath in the normal spine. So the, the cause of that curve in the normal spine is the fact that you have two or three vertebrae that are not nicely segmented or, or whatever. So they, they create a very short congenital scoliosis and the rest of the spine adapts to that. And also in that adaptation curve, the same thing holds true. The, the adaptation curve in the normal spine is also longer anteriorly and um, also there, the disc is where the anterior lengthening is, is located. Mm -hmm. And the last study, the one that we just published, I think a week ago was with in a whale that stranded on a beach in Holland. And the whale was hit by a boat, probably. Apparently it had, at least it had a post-traumatic scoliosis, which was very angular and that killed the animal. But it lived long enough to develop compensatory curves to get its nose in line with its tail again. I thought it was fascinating. Uh -huh. So we didn't study the post-traumatic scoliosis, but we studied the compensatory curve that the animal made in order to be able to at least swim a little bit and get some uh, catch some, some fish and things like that, which didn't save its life in the end. But um, we looked at that compensatory curve, which was in the normal spine of a whale. A whale normally does not develop a scoliosis at all never been described as far as I know. Um, and we looked at that compensatory curve and it showed the same characteristics. It was also lengthened anteriorly in the discs. So the conclusion there was that this um, 3D configuration of a scoliotic spine is, a, is probably a more or less uniform mechanism that is a response of, of not only humans, but it's, it's a more or less universal response to any disturbance or perceived dis disturbance of equilibrium. Right. And then the thing of the, the biomechanics of the human spine come into play that the human spine is so much easier to start rotating. So once that occurs, you have this disturbance of equi equilibrium and then it just follows the same course as it does in, in, in all the other types of scoliosis also. So I thought that was a very interesting study. So if you have a, for instance, a thoracic curve and you have you know, initial anterior column uh, lengthening, maybe in a couple segments. As you said, it can result in a thoracic curve, but you might have a comp compensatory curve. But if you have the compensatory lumbar curve long enough that you'll actually see anterior column increasing in that area too, as the body tries to find an equilibrium. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. For some reason, it, it starts to sort of corkscrew where the anterior column moves out to the side. It, it's out of the, 
mid sagittal loading zone more or less it it, it becomes it, it becomes freer it, it becomes less loaded entirely and it starts to open up which accelerates the process more or less okay now since uh in terms of treating uh, scoliosis, when you know the mechanism for progression is the lengthening of the anterior column, um, if you look at uh, anterior fusion, they do basically a disc release to try and reduce the anterior column. Um, with posterior fusion, they try to do that with the pedicle screws and parenting rods. Uh, with tethering, they try and exert, you know, force on the apex of the curve on the convex side with the tether a little bit more anterior, but not truly anterior. Yeah. First, may I perhaps go back to that disc uh, resection, which you don't, of course, do with the tethering, but you do with the anterior uh, fusion techniques. I think that's very logical. And, and I think we live in an era of posterior fusions more than anterior. But if you really want to correct a scoliosis in 3D, you either have to do some sort of lengthening posteriorly, which is limited, which you can, I mean, you can take out just about any, everything, but still the lengthening posteriorly is relatively limited. The alternative would be to go anterior and take out the disc. And, and I've done that and I've done that not, not, you know, not as a standard procedure because the posterior techniques are so reliable and you avoid opening the chest. But I think, that's a very logical way to go. And I know Michael Roof from Germany has some very nice examples where he only took out discs and the curve reduced. And then he did a final fusion a couple of weeks later and he could save segments just by taking out discs and letting the spine realign even without traction he did it. So I thought that was a very interesting um, thing too. What's your opinion on vertebral body tethering in terms of a uh, treatment response to scoliosis. So now about tethering. I think um, tethering is um, a very good technique. I've, I've never done it. Unfortunately, we were not able to get the tethering uh, uh, equipment in the Netherlands at the time that I was looking into it. Um, uh, there was a rep in Germany and he came to see me, but there were all sorts of ob obstacles to get it to my place. Um, but I think it's very interesting. And I've, I've operated with um, uh, Stéphane Parlant in, in Montreal uh, mm -hmm. did others and um, I've seen them and I think they're they're very interesting. I think they they have good uh, good opportunities of, of correcting the spine and keeping it flexible also and I think that has been shown. Um, I think the poor results are because the curves are too too big. I think you should do it in a flexible curve not because you cannot correct it if it's if it's too big. I mean, you know, we keep pushing the the the, the envelope envelope, and 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 the boundaries are, are are there to be taken care of. And I don't think that's the right way to to do tethering. I think tethering should be done in a curve where you still have a chance of equalizing the disc again. You, what you want to do in a, in a tether procedure, I would say, is that you make the end place of the vertebrae as horizontal as, as possible. And you can only do that if there's not too much uh, structural deformity in the disc. If that, that curvature has been there for, for quite some time, and if that curvature has become too big, you, you have contractures of the disc, you cannot horizontalize the end plates anymore or make them parallel anymore. So um, I would say that tethering is a good way to to provide something like an internal brace more effective than a brace internal brace kind of thing uh, of course you can do a tether procedure for a curve 60 degrees but i doubt if you will have the good results in that group right well the i guess like all uh, scoliosis surgeries uh, you know the stiffness the inherent stiffness of the spine uh, dictates the amount of correction so with tethering if you can only only bend to 30 degrees, then that's probably the max you're going, going to achieve. Now, yeah. there are some um, uh, surgeons who try and uh, release the disc, uh, not remove the disc, but maybe yeah. incise the disc, maybe incise the anterior longitudinal ligament to try and reduce the column. Um, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, um, it's, that's, you know, I think that's, that's all. Um, First of all, I think we're we're 
still in our learning curve for that technique. Um, so uh, I believe in tethering if you do it in not too stiff, not too big curves. I think if you try to broaden the indications, you might get some correction. I think you will lose, uh, first of all, you, you'll get some complications of your, your tether breakage and things like that, which is not a, not a disaster, but it has to be taken care of. Um, you will have less correction, which may, may be a disappointment for the patient. Um, so in sizing the disc, yeah, you probably gain some flexibility if you do that on the concavity because these concave annulus fibers are, are shortened. Um, so if you release those, you will get some correction. You have to go to the other, the other around the, 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 the disc or through the disc. So, you know, you're, you're creating damage to the disc and that will make the disc less flexible. And I think in the end you will, what you try to achieve is a motion preserving solution. I think in the end you might lose some of that motion, but I think we're still in the learning curve and we don't really know what that'll be on the long run. Okay. Um, and it seems that the, with uh, vertebral body tethering, it has the most impact probably on the coronal curve, not so much sagittal and not so much uh, rotation. Um, the question I have is that just through my investigation and trying to figure out the chicken and egg scenario, yeah. Is it rotation that causes the hypokyphosis or is it hypokyphosis that causes the rotation or is it coupled yeah. together? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and, and you think I know. <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of, of which theory you believe in. I believe in the theory and I cannot prove that. I think first of all, first of all these motions are coupled. In scoliosis, they're coupled, not in normal motion of the spine. If you bend your, your spine forward or backward, you don't get rotation automatically. Or if you bend sideways, you get some rotation, but you can get rotation into the concavity or into the convexity that can differ also. So uh, in scoliosis, these motions are coupled. So it's very difficult to say which comes first because once one happens, the other starts to happen also. But well, maybe you're, you're, I'm sure you're aware of the, um, the theories of Dixon and Dixon, and which was something that was mentioned by Somerville before Dixon and by Rove before Dixon, but really dates back to these old anatomists that I talked about, like, like Lawrence and people like that. But Dixon believed that the um, lordosis came first. And then once you have that lordosis, it can only do one thing. And that is to rotate to the side to enable the head to remain uh, centralized over the pelvis. Um, maybe that's how it goes. I think it's different. I think it starts with rotation. I think the rotation is the, is the first that happens. I think it starts as a rotational instability. And I'm happy to say that Dr. Dubousset, uh, who, who I admire greatly, he thinks it starts with rotation too. And um, um, so I, I feel in pretty good company, but Dixon knew a lot, knows a lot about scoliosis too. So I don't want to, to, um, to say anything critical about his theory, but I think, you know, for me, it starts with rotation. And once it rotates the axis of the rotation is posterior to the spine. We know that, and that's where the tether, the anatomical tether, not the artificial tether, but the anatomical tether is located with all the ligaments and the facet joints. So it rotates around that posterior tether. Uh, the anterior part swings out to the side, becomes unloaded and opens up and becomes longer in that, in that manner. So for me, it starts with rotation and the uh, anterior lengthening, lengthening occurs simultaneously, but I think it's secondary to the rotation. Okay. Because um, reading one of your papers, you were, you were talking about how um, uh, if you're trying, for instance, in a, in a bracing technique yeah. to, uh, you know, derotate or even with surgery, right? Trying to derotate the spine to get a better sagittal, oh, sorry, coronal correction. Yeah. You're going to probably uh, in, increase the amount of lower doses or hypokyphosis. So okay. it, it's very much a um, give and take or a compromise. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah we published a paper that's called um, uh, it compared different strategies and the uh, the final words were which plane will suffer so you know if you go for a lot of correction in the coronal plane um, normally you would lose something in the sagittal plane and what you would lose would mean an increased lordosis or a flat back or whatever we call that that's not due to the medical screw technique, it's due to the fact that the anatomy is such that once you rotate that spine back to the midline, you're confronted with the anterior additional length that has to go somewhere. Well, you can compress the disc a little bit if you don't take them out. If you would take them out, you could do that much more. But if you don't take them out, you can compress them a little bit. You can lengthen posteriorly by, by doing ponte osteotomies uh, and doing wide releases, so you can gain uh, something. But um, in the end, if you have a very big curve in, uh, in, in the coronal plane, um, if you try to correct that fully, if you could, you would end up with a pretty significant lordosis. With your research, and um, I know you're, you've been working with um, a bit of a spring systems with respect to uh, early onset scoliosis. And uh, lately you've published some uh, paper regarding using both a tether and a spring system. So the tether, I assume, is to, well, you're, creating, you're trying to create a scoliosis in a, in a pig model, pig animal model, as proof of concept and your spring is to address more of the rotation concept as well. So you have the tether and you have a rotational torsion spring together. Can you talk about why you are looking at that particular approach? Yeah, well, we have treated um, uh, at least 80, close to 100 patients now with a spring-driven system, which we call SDS, a spring distraction system. And we've published on that also. That's uh, together with my my colleague and, and, and actually good friend uh, Moyo Kraut. He um, he is is pretty much the technical brain behind this whole uh, construct, uh, based on some of the th theoretical work that we just discussed. Um, so we have this spring uh, distraction system SDS in close to 100 patients, working very well for early onset scoliosis, being more or less of a um, alternative for, a, for, for uh, traditional growing rods or also the magnetically dri driven growing rods. So that's one issue. The other issue is that there is, and we have a patent on, on, on that SDS uh, system. The other thing is that there is another system that we're involved in, but that's developed by the University of Twente uh, in the Netherlands, the Eastern part of the country, where uh, there is a torsional spring. And that is very interesting if you think about the early stages and like in internal braces, if you, if you believe that the initial problem in scoliosis is rotation of certain segments, if you could with a spring driven system that, that holds it, its, its power until the spring is totally relaxed, of course, but that holds its power for, for quite some time and you could derotate the spine, you could start thinking about a cure of the scoliosis. So we wanted to look into that more and we developed an animal model, and that's the uh, mini pig, uh, Göttingen mi mini pig, which is used for, for this type of research uh, more often. And we wanted to create a scoliosis. Göttingen mini pig does not develop a scoliosis spontaneously. They don't have idiopathic scoliosis. So you have to induce a scoliosis. But whether you rotate to the right or rotate to the left, that's the same principle, of course. I mean, in one case, if the spine is straight and you rotate to the right, you get a right thoracic curve and you induce a scoliosis, but that means if that works, you could also rotate the other way around and rotate it back from the rotate position. So that's, that's you know, that's, that's not a principal difference. That's, that's, uh, 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 that's not a principal issue. So we, um, we developed that, um, that uh, study setup and we felt that, you know, we, we wanted to create that scoliosis and we've felt that we could create it with the spring only, but in case that would not work, we did not know that at that time, we thought we would have a fail safe mechanism with the tether because other um, uh, setups have described using a tether to create a scoliosis in a growing pig. So that tether is initially very loose, very slack, and it's meant to only start uh, the scoliosis development through the rotating spring uh, or the torsion spring, I should say, 
But if that would not work, we would end up with a scoliosis eventually, thanks to the tether. And we are now doing experiments. Uh, actually, we're not doing them yet, but we, um, we, uh, we will do them where we look only at the effect of the spring in order to create that scoliosis. And we're looking at that scoliosis in 3D. And what it showed was that that 3D configuration of the spine is very similar to humans, uh, human idiopathic scoliosis and, and the other types with anterior lengthening in the disc. Hmm. And we're now also looking at whether it's possible once you have created that scoliosis to rotate it back and, and basically solve the scoliosis. And of course, also looking at whether the the spine remains mobile and, and does not fuse uh, spontaneously. Right, that's pretty fascinating. Do you plan on uh, limiting that to early onset scoliosis or to, is there potential for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis as well? Yeah, I think, I think you know, it, it, for me, the issue with um, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is that you should try to, to treat it at an early stage. And we are, since we are, we've basically all of us in, in large parts of the world have abandoned school screening, we're faced with bigger curves and we can only do, you know, we can try a brace and if it doesn't work, we have to do a fusion. But I think a little bit more awareness or much more awareness of the earlier phases of scoliosis is very important. And of course you get the issue of whether a curve that starts at, at 15, 20 degrees will evolve into a curve of 50, 60, 70 degrees. But then again, you know, we have some predictive models and people are working on that. And we know that if you have an idiopathic curve in a child pre-adolescence um, with, with open triradius and it's 30, 30 degrees or 25 degrees, well, you know, I, if, if I would have to bet on it, it will probably progress. So if, if we would be able to catch those earlier and if we, but first of all, of course, proof that this approach would work, that I would be very much in favor of treating them early. And I think maybe you could, with your derotation strategy, um, you could hopefully at least realign the spine. And you know, you don't have to do that for life because we know that once you're mature, the chances of developing a scoliosis, or if you have a small remaining curve, the chances of that getting worse are very minimal, of course. So we have this window of a couple of years from, from onset of puberty, like open triradiates, uh, Visser zero to, to Sanders eight, uh, to have them all uh, in, in, in this discussion, uh, the maturation system, uh, at least the most used systems. But um, if we could bridge that period and keep the spine in line, the problem should not be too big of a problem anymore. And uh, well, in that hypothetical case, uh, when they reach maturity, would you just remove the hardware? Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, I, I guess you would because I don't think it'd be very attractive to to walk around with with some springs in your in your back. But then again, you know, we thought about that for for fracture treatment also. Many people had a plate in their ankle or in their in their femur or a nail and they were all removed. But by now we are, we basically know that the disadvantage of, of removing it are probably in many cases greater than just leaving it in place. So I don't know what will be the end, you know, what, what will be the verdict on that if you should leave it. But I think for now, I would prefer to, to remove it probably. Okay. We're very far, you know, this is very hypothetical. <laughs> I don't, uh, don't, don't think that's a, Not to what I understand, but it's got the ideas have to start somewhere, right? And um, yeah. you, ha you have progressed to uh, animal models, so it it makes me believe that there there is some um, some great science behind it to even get this far, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's practical science. I'm I'm a surgeon, and I've I've always my my emphasis has always been on patient care. Um, but the research part is, and, and that's what I told you in the beginning, you know, I, I hesitated to go to the university, but I'm very happy that I did. I had a great time in, in my more general practice before, um, really uh, treated patients more than anything else. And thought that was a very gratifying uh, existence. But um, I think the research that came from going to the university has really, um, you know, giving it another dimension also, which, which has been very gratifying as well. Uh, you mentioned that uh, with, for instance, traditional bracing, you know, 21 hours, I guess a minimum 18 hours, 
versus a nighttime brace where you're horizontal. So, you know, in a daytime brace saying it's, it's created for you to be vertical, the nighttime brace says it's created to when you're horizontal or supine. Um, one of my concerns with uh, traditional bracing is that, you know, if you're trying to derotate a very hy hypokyphotic thoracic area, especially if it's a little bit more stiff, um, the, oftentimes they'll make that hypokyphosis more low rhodotic. Yeah. Is, with nighttime bracing, is that not as much a worry because the spine is not loaded? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure if, I mean, if you have a fixed spine that is lordotic from T2 to, to L1, um, it's probably different than if you, ha so, I mean, having a, f a flat back after surgery is a problem and having a hypokyphosis is a problem. And it's also a problem or having a true lordosis. In many cases, it's a true lordosis. It's also a problem because you get these junctional problems. The more um, hypokyphosis you have in the thoracic area, the more junctional problems you may run into. I'm not sure if that's the same thing with conservative treatment because the thing remains mobile. Um, and then again, of course, over time, people get more kyphotic anyway. So if you would have a mobile spine that is slightly hypokyphotic at the end of your conservative treatment, I mean, because it's not fixed, you're not going to have junctional problems because the whole thing is, is harmonious, more or less, or at least it's mobile. Mm -hmm. So in the end, over time, you will gradually get less, um, less uh, uh, posterior uh, in, uh, sagittal balance or, or less hypokyphosis. So I don't think we know too, mu too much about this yet, but I, I can imagine that that might not be too big of a problem. If you project, look into your crystal ball, 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future, where do you see scoliosis treatment uh, heading? I would hope that we will start treating earlier and would hope that with conservative treatment, we would be able to um, prevent some operations. I think the, the surgery is great. I mean, it's never been so good. People are in the hospital three, four, uh, days and and you know walk around from day one and have a beautifully corrected spine but i still think it would be better if we could figure out something to avoid having uh, like like 15 or 20 screws in your back and two rods um, even though i think that for the thoracic area that's the perfect solution in most cases for the lumbar area it's a little bit different of course but i would hope that we would be able to to be more effective um, in conservative treatment having different race concept but first of all catch them earlier i think if we you know as long as we say okay at the end of growth if you have a curve of 45 50 degrees we call it a good result well that is probably not what we should consider a good result and that that's because that's where the surgical limit is but i think if you're uh, 16 uh, 18 years old and you have a curve of 50 degrees chances that you will progress are, are close to 100 percent or at least pretty pretty great and you may have some problems later in your life. If you would end your growing period with a curve of less than 30 degrees, that would be something else. So I would hope we would be able to catch them early and treat them conservatively. I consider the scoliosis very much a, like I said, mechanical problem of the soft tissue. The bone changes, of course, but in the later stages of the disorder, uh, initially it's, it's predominantly in the, in the soft tissues and, and like, like the disc. Um, so I'm, I'm at the moment very interested in, in trying to, to think of how you could possibly uh, improve conservative care. I think conservative care is, is, I'm not saying it's not good, but how could you make a principal change in how you treat scoliosis conservatively? And I cannot say how that, that should be done. So I think that might be something, um, I think the advent of nighttime braces might mean something, the literature supports now that at least for a number of curves, uh, nighttime bracing only is, is probably as effective as full time um, because you're in the brace uh, fewer hours, but the correction is more. In, in the nighttime bracing, they go not for 50% of correction, they go to 70 or close to 100% of correction because the spine is not loaded. 
So that might be a difference. And I think these tether um, investigations, but also hopefully um, some of our spring work will um, open up possibilities for temporary dynamic correction, like an internal brace concept. Mm -hmm. And then at the, end of, at the end of the line, you'll always have these uh, uh, very effective surgeries that, that are really uh, usually a, a predictable, a good result also, but, but still having your spine fused at the age of 16 is something that might be nice to avoid, if possible. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Castellan, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I learned a lot um, and I look forward to more of your research and especially your uh, torsional spring system. It's pretty okay. fascinating. Great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Excellent. Okay, have a thank great day. Okay.